Great. Let's try again, Joanne. <laughs> Where do, you, where do you want me to, I can hear you loud and clear. Where would you like me to pick up? Because I'm not sure what you could hear and what you couldn't hear. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to introduce you, Joanne, COO of McDonald's South Africa. And Joanne, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself okay, and, your so story, and your story into sort of the role that you play at McDonald's now. Not a problem. Thank you and good evening again, everybody. Um, um, well, in October of this year, I celebrate 25 years with McDonald's South Africa. I literally started off as a trainee manager in 1995 and worked very um, various roles, um, some less enjoying <laughs> and some a little bit more corporate facing. Um, and I literally sort of had the opportunity to move from what we would very often in McDonald's refer to is move from the crew room or the restaurant environment into the boardroom. Wow. And obviously with, with within my corporate role, that's now very much, um, you know, how my role is focused, partnering with our franchise business unit, uh, heading up our risk division. At the same time in my current portfolio, I also have an emerging business, which is our delivery business, food delivery business that I, I spearhead in the organization. I'm originally from Heidelberg in the Western Cape, born to okay. a single mother, second eldest uh, of, you, we used to be four, but our youngest brother had passed away many, many years ago. Okay. And then because I was not a very healthy sibling, I used to suffer from asthma. I had to move to Cape Town at the age of three, where I was reared by my other mother uh, and her husband, uh, Francis and Norman Chetty in Kensington. And um, they reared me as their own. And I, for, for me, that was my parents. But I always knew who my mother was because there was always an arrangement that every single vacation I'd go home to her. So for me, I thought I was quite chuffed as a young little girl, having the opportunity to have more than one parent and then to be able to spend um, vacations and holidays in the Platteland, at the coast, at the beach with my other siblings. So I thoroughly enjoyed my, my childhood. Um, it wasn't always easy but I, I took away a lot of the fond memories. And I was schooled in Kensington. I attended Kensington High. I completed my BCom degree at the University of the Western Cape, where I met my husband in my first year. Okay. I met my husband when I was 18 years old and married him five years later, um, just before joining McDonald's uh, and having the opportunity to, you know, to become a wife, a mother, and to pursue a career almost all at the same time, which was which was quite an interesting yet challenging journey. That that must have been quite an interesting journey. Um, so tell us, how does a small town girl dare to dream this big? You know what? It's when you're told not to dare to dream. Mm. I think for me, I was never, nobody ever actually told me that I shouldn't dream. And that if I did, if I wanted to dream, that I needed permission. So I think the one thing that I, ref, that I always reflect on with, with the theme around the day to dream is I was never told not to imagine, not to aspire. Even though, um, if you can think back years back, you know, we didn't really have social media, which yeah. meant that your role models were typically people that you would have contact with. Yes. For me, it, at a very young age, three very strong, yet uniquely different women shaped who I am today. It's my biological mother, Liza Barlow, my aunt who reared me, who I call Mama, Frances Chetty, and my mother-in-law that I met at the age of 18, Lorraine Devet. Mm. Three very different women, but characters uh, and, and had, um, you know, uh, personality traits that really inspired me to, to aspire to greater things um, yes. at a very, you know, from all the times that I've had engaged with them from a very young age to up to the point even having met my mother-in-law at 18 years old. Wow, yeah, that, that, that's quite exciting. It's as if you are standing on the shoulders of giants. Tell me, Joanne, what are some of the nuggets that they planted? What are some of the seeds that they planted in your life that allowed you to grow into who you are today? If I had to start off with my mother, it was always, she always had a very optimistic um, outlook on life. Yes. and was very um, passionate and compassionate human being. So, you know, always um, from, from my 
childhood memories, somebody that would always plant a seed around forgiveness and the importance of forgiving someone else in order for you to actually grow beyond um, a certain circumstance. Yes. If I think of my mama, work ethic. For her, it was always around, you know, uh, providing yes. and always understanding that as a woman, you can contribute and you must do what you can to be able to contribute to your society and to contribute to your household. So, you know, a, a very, very strong with work ethic is something that I took out from, from, my, from mama. And then for my mother-in-law, it was about never being ashamed of requiring the support of others in order for you to be able to have a family that is physically healthy, emotionally stable, and that is embedded in the spirit. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, so, that's so interesting. The last point specifically, especially in this time of, um, you know, we are, we're in a national pandemic and as women uh, or people in general, it's very hard to, to ask for support and to accept support. Um, I always say support is, uh, you know, we need to redefine it as shared strength. I like that. Uh, that's for me is a good learning and a good take out from this conversation. Um, and you know what? It wasn't easy for me to do because I always felt that I needed to do everything. And mm -hmm. I, I found out very early as a mother and as a wife and as an emerging career woman that trying to be everything to everyone and relying only on yourself, self, you run out of stamina. You suffer yeah. from burnout very quickly. And I didn't, I, would, I recognized that I wasn't a great person to be around when I was trying to control everything and try and rely on myself to, um, you know, execute everything. Um, yes. You become, you know, I, I wanted the house to be clean. So I wouldn't, I would not hire somebody. I would do it myself either overnight, whether it's late night, early mornings, um, because my mother-in-law was such a, a brilliant housewife. So for yes. me, it was, I got to, I got to run a household as well as she does. When it came mm -hmm. to working hard and working long hours, mama yeah. used to, you know, she represented that. So for me, it was when you're at, in a working environment, you've got to give more than a hundred percent. And then if I look at my mother, it was about, you still got to go to church. You got to be involved in your faith. You, you know, you still got to be uh, um, connected with society um, and be in inverted commas, almost that role model yes. without it being declared as a role model at the time. And I think sometimes I felt at that early ages, um, I took it to the extreme of trying to be so perfect that it became exhausting and I couldn't mm. maintain that pace. Mm. But mm. I, didn't, I needed other people to support me and assist me. And I very often tease and say, you know, between um, my family, my husband's family, my husband, you know, they, they all became that winged beneath my wings. They allowed me to grow in areas that I would not have been able to have grown into if I didn't have their support. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, reading your biography and reading your journey through the McDonald's family, um, you also uh, engaged in all of their learning and went into their sort of internal university. So, so you invested in a lot in, in learning as well as growing and developing yourself. Um, that's quite a commitment. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it is. I think part of the McDonald's culture and probably one of the reasons I've been with the brand for as long as I have. The first reason is the... <laughs> I should have sent it to you. <laughs> Your next live show, you'll get it. You'll get a delivery from me. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Sorry to show you. Um, so I think the first thing was the values of the organization and the culture. Yeah. There was an element of overlap between my personal cultural and value values uh, um, system and that of the brand. And then the brand is very much focused on supporting individuals who have a desire to learn and a desire to lead. Right. Whether they're interested in leading themselves or whether they're interested in leading others or a market or a division or a region. And I think that's what kept me uh, curious, kept me engaged, because even though I've been with the same global brand for 25 years, it felt like I have worked for 
a multitude of organizations mm. because the brand hasn't remained stagnant. You know, the business, the business has evolved. And as the business evolved, you always had to acquire new skills, which means in some instances, you had to volunteer to participate in certain wow. of those hamburger university courses. Um, yes. to be able to be come to remain relevant and some of the courses believe it or not e are equivalent to an MBA mm. where it's been specifically crafted in a McDonald's environment even though you might have to do syndicate work and the syndicate work may include individuals from different countries yes. and not just you're not just confined to to the exposure of of the country where, where you sort of um, uh, you know operating in yeah. And, you know, the, the fantastic thing about syndicate work is that um, that is where the growth comes in, in the learning, because you have to learn to work with individuals and to cooperate and to collaborate with people who are vastly different from you. True. And I think that's where that additional appreciation for, you know, working with a diverse global workforce came in for me, because, you know, mm -hmm. the language you use you got to be conscious of the language you use. You got yeah. to be conscious of, um, you know, uh, a certain cultural nuances that you might think is acceptable within your culture in South Africa that could be deemed to be offensive when you're in a, in, yeah. a, in another country or you're engaging with an individual from a different culture. Yeah, yeah. So, so well done on that. But talking about leadership, you also um, Tell us a little bit about the women's leadership uh, roles that you played in Africa and in, a, in the McDonald's uh, organization. So I, I started off participating in the, in, in the uh, regional women's leadership network that was oh. focused in the Asia, Middle East and Africa and specific region. That was probably around about 2008. And yeah. eventually, my, the, the roles and the structures in the organization, the global structure had changed. So oh. currently, I participate on an, an advisory board. And the advisory board is uh, a direct advisor to the chief people officer of McDonald's globally, mm. as well as the uh, CEO of McDonald's globally. And okay. there we talk in that forum, we, are, we have that, let's call it that safe space just to introduce concepts and learnings that we believe are preventing uh, um, us from advancing in from a, from a diversity and inclusion perspective as, as, as rapidly as we could. And so we've adopted this belief that diversity is inclusion. It's not diversity and inclusion, because yes. if it's diverse, it means that we've included, there's, there's an element of representation. Yes. Uh, for us, it's very important that, and we, we, we sort of focused a lot on the women's agenda to yeah. say that women who is more than 60% of the, um, let's call it the employees of the, that global base, making yes. sure that those individuals, we, we can indicate or, or demonstrate that we are valuing the contributions they make. And we yes. really focused on, we've actually put together a diversity and inclusion strategy um, that's, that's been heavily based around uh, uh, women and, mm. and the, uh, you know, the advancement of women within the McDonald's business and mm. making sure that they're recognized, that they're represented in different levels, that yes. we remove any barriers that prevents them from rising to the yeah. occasion. Because in some markets, believe it or not, women stop aspiring when they reach a certain point. Yeah. Because in their minds, they need to, they believe when we, when we sort of interviewed them, they would say to us, but you know, I now need to get married. I now want to have children. And I, I can't aspire to having a career beyond the level that I am now. And we start seeing them exiting because yeah. they get to a point where they believe it's, an, it's a choice. Hmm. And they, they exit the business to focus on family and, you know, being, uh, being a, a, a good wife, if I can use that word. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, it, and you know, it's so, um, you know, we, women are then uh, almost, um, you know, have to take a back step for building society and for building family, which is quite an unfair advantage, you know, or, yeah. or situation. And, you I know, see. talking about women and talking about um, some of the, the challenges that women are having, um, you know, Joanne, last year, I'm, not, I'm sure you've heard, but last year I spent some time in the Eastern Cape with some very rural women, 
Yeah, so very rural women and women at risk and looking, because I work in the space of, uh, you know, working with violence against women and children. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges, even in 2020, is the fact that um, so many women don't have access to just sanitary wear. You know, uh, a normal monthly natural cycle. And we've come so far with technology, with so many things in society. But women are, are, are being faced with a, almost a violent choice of, well, do I buy sanitary towels? Do I buy um, a loaf of food or food? You know, Agree and you know, coming from a small town and coming from humble beginnings, you know that it's not always easy, you know. And, and so we really at Succeed wanting to partner with people to say, you know, let's end this violent choice. Let's give women yeah. the, the equal opportunity to be able to go to work, to uh, be able to go to school, to curb absenteeism in schools by 75%. Because when that girl child is home alone, she's also at risk. She's at grave risk of violence. <laughs> and, you know, it sits her back almost a week, a month. Um, from her male colleagues. And um, we, we just want to change that, you know. It's something that we shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a discussion. It should just be, let's just sort this out, you know. And if um, you think of it, it should be a right. Yeah. Because that talks to the dig dignity of women. So yeah. it shouldn't even be a sacrifice. It shouldn't be even a choice. It should be a, a right. Um, so it's, it's, it's I'm even at a loss <laughs> to think that that in this modern day and age, that's still that basic need is still not being addressed. That's still not being addressed. And it's it's really heartbreaking to be honest with you. And when you look at obviously the the, the impact of, of uh, violence in our country, you know, against women, it's 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 really, really something that's heartbreaking. So we we're very um um adamant, even in this climate and in the situation, that we uh, want to make that difference. Yeah, and you know, I just share with you a, a story. At uh, this year, some of the men in McDonald's had come together, yeah. and specifically around the way women are treated, <coughs> ensuring that their rights are maintained, that they're not victimized, mm. that they not, you know, they don't suffer any form of violent abuse. And they actually came together this year to um, to almost openly share their support for women. We wow. actually um, they've created a little bit of a fund where you can contribute to the fund. And, and we've got a legal entity that will represent any women in our business that mm. are suffering from any form of violence and abuse that wow. want to um, you know, take things further, but may not necessarily have the right skills, the right financial backing. And we as a brand are prepared to support them. And an initiative 100% initiated by the men in the business. Wow, you know, it's just, it's really amazing um, how so many good men are stepping up um, to make that difference. That's really commendable because most women don't take it up because they don't have the support and also the legal system and the legal fees are just astronomical, yeah. you know, but also that there's And I think course. if you think of it, yeah. Yes, and that's why women, very often a lot of women fear to have the fear of, of, of going to the full extent of, you know, some of them might be able to remove themselves from the situation, but when they think of um, anything beyond that, even if it includes, you know, taking legal action, whether it's, you know, um, wanting to formally apply for a divorce, they don't yes. know because the first thing they're thinking of, can I afford it? If yes. I leave my partner, even though I may be working, you know, you know, what's going to happen to the kids? Am I going to be able to provide for those children? Um, so mm -hmm. that's some of the conversations that's coming through. And the minute that fear sets in, what do women do? M Which in means? most cases, they'll stay. Yeah. Um, whether, whether, whether the situation is healthy or not. Yeah. In fact, 80% of women don't leave. 80% of women don't leave. Because they can't. They just can't. You know? So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that platform. So tell us a little bit about um, what, would you, what advice would you give young women starting in their career. You started as a trainee, you said you started as a <coughs> and now you're sitting in the advisory board with the global CEO. I mean, that's something, Joel. you know? So what, um, what advice would you give uh, young women and young men starting off in their careers? I think it starts off with your theme, right? Dare to dream. Yeah. Because that's, that's the first thing for me. 
Um, and I think <coughs> that for parents, and I'm a parent, and that's, some, so that's always been and continues to be a learning curve for me. Um, I don't think you ever perfect it. It's, you know, you, you keep on going at it and, and, and you get a little bit better, but with different children, it might have different effects. So yes. I think for me, it was always around dare to dream. And with my children specifically, I try and not to, I and mean, I'm very conscious of the words I use. So words such as um, saying to your children, um, you know, be careful. If mm. you continue with this behavior, you will amount to nothing. So yeah. we, we mean it in, in my culture, we mean it as a way of motivation. But what we don't understand is we seed um, ideas of lack of self-worth, um, ideas of potential failure. So, mm. and, it, and it may prevent individuals from, or children from aspiring to something greater because parents' words can either create an environment of security or insecurity whether it's intentional or not, because I think we all strive to do our best. So I think the first one for me is dare to dream. The second one for me is, and I've used this to frame my own journey, and that is that hope is not a strategy. I can have the dream, I can have the desire, but there's got to be some, there's got to be the progressive steps that you take to move closer to that dream, if I can use um, those words. Yeah. Um, and I always found what was very important, I had a high school um, English teacher, Mr. Pandit, uh, and, you know, hopefully he rests in peace because he passed away about two years ago and he's still very young. I think he was 50 or just, what, 55 or something when he had passed away. And what was interesting is, it, uh, you know, if I had to listen to Mr. Pandit, it was around, you've got to define success for yourself. Um, mm. that only you can determine what that success would look like. I've learned yeah. in my journey that I've had to, had to leverage three key things, my education yeah. and not just my academics, my spiritual education, because that was very, it was part of um, growing up was being embedded in the spirit from a very young age. Yeah. Then there was, uh, for me, it was about my experience, always learning from your different experiences, whether it was experience mm. within workplace or whether it was within my uh, personal capacity. And yeah. then the last one was around exposure. You gotta be conscious about who you expose yourself to. Yeah. Because if, if exposure is, is, is positive, it could potentially move you closer to that dream. If the exposure is negative, there could be negative impacts including your engagement with social media. Because believe yes. if it or not, in today's um, times, so certain things that you may post on social media at a very young age, which is very innocent, may have an unintended consequence when you're trying to get to that employment, that process of employment. And I give a silly example, you applying to become the head of a, comms, you know, a communications role. Mm but there may have been stuff that you innocently done at a very young age that might make a company decide whether they appoint you or not appoint you. Yes. Unless yes. of course you can, you can position it differently. And I think for me, I've learned that defining that success, leveraging my education, my experience and exposure is what I've learned to almost discover, if I can use that words, what I believe yes. is a combination of purpose and calling. Because mm. even though they sound very similar, they can be very different. And yeah. sometimes you can achieve something through a means that you never anticipated. i give you an example. When I was young, I wanted to become an air hostess. I knew in, I think we call it Senate 5 then, grade 7 in today's terms. I wanted yes. to become an air hostess. My purpose was to travel the world. Yeah. I didn't know what, it need, what I needed to do to be able to qualify. I had no idea. I've never even flown. So I don't know mm. why I thought that, you know, I would enjoy it. But what was interesting is I, I then pursued a career that has allowed me to travel the world. Yes. So sometimes, you know, what you believe should be the route or the journey to achieve that outcome. And if my outcome was to travel and see the world, mm. a lot of my behaviors may have led to me traveling the world, but it not necessary. I did not necessarily take the route that I initially thought. So I yes. think also to say to young people, don't be stuck on the the how. Oh. 
So long as you're always reflecting and, and intimately checking that what it is you're doing is moving you closer to, I want to use that word, the what. <laughs> It's, it's, it's always, it's, it's that um, sort of that check and balance for me. Yeah, yeah, that's so important. And you know, what you're saying, you know, then leads me to the fact, you know, at, at Succeed as well, what we do is we don't, we don't do two people. So we don't drop these, these sanitary towels off in a community and leave. What we do is we, we journey with the community in educating girls, in helping them to build their self-worth, in helping to destigmatize um, having a menstrual cycle as a woman, you know, destigmatize the shame of that, uh, because there's so much of um, self worth and and like like you say, it, some children or some young people do not even dare to dream, you know, and and part of our training and upskilling, you know, Joanne, when the light comes on in somebody's eyes, you know you've reached something inside of them, right. then you know that they are unstoppable as a young person. But so many people in South Africa have this dull look in, the, in their eyes as if there's no hope. And that's what Seeds of Hope wants to do. That's what we wanna do at Succeed. We wanna really bring restoration in terms of dignity, self-worth, education, um, and to journey with, with, the, with individuals. You know, the way, the way McDonald's is journeying with women, it's quite commendable. You know, it makes you, everybody want to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, tell me a little bit about um, the, the, your faith and how faith has played a role in your life. So very much involved in, in the church from a very young age. I think my, my mama who reared me, one of her tactics to keep me off the street was sport, embedding sport. So I played a lot of sports. Can you believe I did yeah. hockey, ballet, I did soccer, I did softball, I did hockey, I did netball. They always kept me busy. But at the same time, she was always very conscious to make sure that my involvement in the church was yeah. I was equally active. So whether it's being youth, Bible studies, I mean, I was always very busy. So I think for me, you know, adopting uh, the Lord as, as my savior, that started at, I, I remember, around about 16 years old on, on a youth mm -hmm. camp. And, you know, you go through the journey of accepting and then you go through the journey of life. And then every single time, you know, I something significant would happen. You'd always remind, be reminded about your faith. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's always been a very important part of my, my, my um, success. Uh, yeah. Another important part for me was I always found it very interesting, whoever... It so happened to be members of my team, people that I lead, who also had the same, um, you know, very similar beliefs and spiritual grounding, um, which I always found very fascinating because it can make it very easy to, to work with team members, you know, that are, that are, that are spiritually grounded. But I think yeah. my biggest challenge with, with my, where your, my faith had come to test was in 2015. In 2015, my eldest son was involved in a motorbike accident. Brent had significant brain trauma to the brain. So where a normal brain has a Glasgow scale reading of 15 out of 15 and yeah. 80 is critical, Brent was six. And what was interesting for me is, is that you never know what your ability is, or I've not known that until I had experienced what I call faith in a crisis. Yeah, um, because there's nothing that's like children to do that. And there's nothing like children to do it. You know, mm. Nishani, he, I remember, and, and I love to sing. So mm. in 2014, from October, I kept on, every time I would sing and every, a consciousness would come to me and I'd realize I'm singing, his strength is perfect. And I'm like, why am I singing this? And it's nonstop until mm. the accident on the 28th of April, 2015. And then I, you know, I went through that, that phase of, of what do I do now? Because everything had come to, there was nothing more important than my son. And at the same time, I had to remind myself and my husband that we're not the patient, that whoever is praying has to be praying for Brent because I didn't want to detract from our belief that he would fully recover. Yes. I was very conscious that I didn't, I, I, you know, I said to my husband, you know, I know we love your son and I know that the person that has driven into him has left, you know, has ripped our hearts apart. 
but I cannot have a place for faith and worry. Mm. And I mm. couldn't have a place for restoration on wanting my son to, to fully recover from this, but at the same time have hatred to another. Yeah. And what was interesting is in the entire journey, even in the time that he was in the hospital, <coughs> the nurse one day said to me, you love to sing. And I said, I'm singing. I said, I've yeah. got no idea what I'm singing. And she said to me, I kept on singing to God be the glory. Mm. And when I moved out of the unconscious into the conscious, I realized that to God be the glory is embedded on the crucifixion. Yeah. And I remember the first day when it, his accident took place, I was riding in a, through a little town called Riversdale and we passed a cross and we had put, it was 5 a.m. in the morning because I was, we were in Cape Town when the accident took place and Brent was in Joburg. And my husband and I, I said, my husband decided to take me to George Airport to fly back. And as I'm driving through this little town, I see the cross. We're listening to the 5 a.m. Uh, preach, the morning yeah. preach on Eden FM. And the first message, the uh, Shumanei was the, the, the preacher. She said, through his stripes, he'll be healed. And, we, and, I, and I remember Denver saying to me, my husband saying to me, Joe, I know you're very, very connected to your spirit. Tell me what you feel now. And I said, yeah. I cannot explain to you. But for the first time, I understood. Shush, I can feel it. The first time I understood yeah. the words, the peace of the Lord be with you. And yeah. that peace that passes you that you know that my head is saying, how can I be in such a good space spiritually? Yeah. Because this child is in a critical state. And for yeah. the first time, the head and the spirit were in two opposite ends. And yeah. every single time he would deliver a message to me, a milestone through my 10-year-old boy. We are, that same day I arrived in, in, um, at the airport in Joburg, to go to yeah. Mopok Hospital. I took the, the baby with me, he was five then. He stops in the middle of our timber and he says to me, mommy, Brent is gone. Dishani, I'm a strong woman. I almost broke down at our timber. Mm. But his words to me, he says, mommy, he's on the waves. He's, he's riding the waves, he's going up and down. Dishani, I walked into the hospital, I met the neurologist. Oh, he touched me on pass. the shoulder. He said to me, Mrs. Devet, please understand that the next 40, 24 to 48 hours will be riding a wave. It will be up and down, that's your emotions. Antonio's yeah. words. Yeah. The day Brent woke up, the day before Antonio said to me, mommy, Brent will be awake on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Tuesday I walked in, Brent was awake. And that theme in terms of Brent's progression, if I wanted to know that, you know, you know God finds the most innocent people to deliver, he yeah. delivered it through Antonio and I realized that's when you realize that the Holy Spirit had prepared me in 2014 for something that would be devastating to me in 2015 and to my family in 2015. Yeah. Because we still had to keep the family together. We still had to be very sure that the, the other three boys were emotionally stable through the entire process. Um, and the agreement was, if we break down, we break down in our room behind closed doors. Yeah. And when we walk out, the other boys, we still got to be, I almost want to say engage with them as if they're still living and alive. Yeah. So that for me was my faith in crisis um, and it has grounded me even more so um, post-2015 post than, than before. And today, Brent's running, he's walking, he's, he's up and about. He's wow. maybe not necessarily 100% capable of the things that he's done before, but amazingly alive and living. Mm. And you got <laughs> your, your boy back, eh? You got your boy back. Got our boy back. Yeah, wow. That's such an amazing story. I actually have, have goosebumps, you know, and I'm sure many of us can identify. Um, but thank you. Thank you for sharing um, that journey. Thank you. Just thank you. Thank you. What a brave, um, what a brave journey to have walked. And what a good God. What a good God. Yes. Yes. Miracles come when you least expect them. Yeah. So, you know, that brings us to the point, Joanne. What is your seed of hope? What is your message to, to us this evening? What is it that you want to leave with us? You know, there's two things. I don't necessarily have a mantra, but I have two things that I always sort of, it always sort of um, grounds me. 
I think the first one for me is a little bit embedded in the spirit. So my apologies for, for reading the same message. And it's 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, where it says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength mm -hmm. is made perfect, perfect in your weakness. weakness. And yeah. I'm, rewind, I'm reminded that he can only step in if I can't anymore. And, and I found that that principle applies in my professional environment mm -hmm. as well as in my personal environment. And then there's another one that I also find very dear to me, which is from Shannon L. Uh, Elder. And she sort of says that you need to carve your name on hearts, not tombstones. A legacy oh. is etched um, into the minds of others and the stories they share about you. Oh. So for and me, you know, it's always about, you know, can they share stories about me that talks to an element of servant, servant leadership, mm -hmm. an element of humbleness that demonstrate that living God in me, through me, through my behavior. Wherever you are. Yeah, that's profound. That's profound. And to the young men that you are raising, Joanne, what is your key message? What, what would be a measure of success as a mom to young men that you would know, hey, these boys did well. What would that be? Hmm. Seems to be a bit frozen there, Joanne. Looks like we've lost Joanne for a minute. Let's give her a minute to come back. Okay, there we are. Are you back? We're back. Yeah, <laughs> You're back. Apologies. Yeah. No, no, no. It's fine. We're doing this from home, and you know, it's just amazing that we can embrace this technology and be able to do this. My last question to you is: You're a mother of four young men, and um, you know, I'm finding more and more the role of, uh, of good men uh, is it's just rising in, in in this country, in this world. What would be a measure of success for you as a parent? Um, when you look at your sons, what would you have, what would you define when you say, hey, you know what, they did well in this world. What is your legacy and your message to young men today? Oh, there we go again. I think the first example that I'm going to use is, is are we back? Yes. We seem to the be. The first moving. example I'm going to use is, is that I'll, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Now I can hear you. Okay. So the first example I'll use Denver, my husband. If I look mm. at, you know, uh, for, you know, the role model that his mother was in his life. And I think, you know, being, being able to, as a mother, to rear a son that is comfortable and confident. He's the middle son. He's got an older sister. He's got a younger brother that is confident to support uh, a woman. You know, yes. whether he was, whether he's supporting me for my career, whether he is, and I mean, he's actively involved um, <laughs> with the children. I don't think we'd had so many kids if I didn't have a very participative, supportive and active um, husband. And I yeah. think I'm fortunate and blessed. The, the legacy that I think we as a partnership would leave with, uh, you know, our four sons is the fact that, and, you know, one of my sons reminded me of this once. So, so initially, I was very much sort of still attuned to the, my traditional thinking around women and, you know, yeah. the role that mothers play um, in, the, in a more um, a traditional sense. And he reminded me that, mom, but since I can remember, you've been working. Yeah. And since I can remember, you've been traveling. Yeah. But I know you love me. And I know that you and daddy would do anything to be there to celebrate moments that's significant to us versus just being there. Um, and that for me was, was quite profound at the time because I think he was then, Matthew was then about five or six years old. And all he wanted yeah. me to do was to attend uh, his first um, a little athletics event. Yeah. And I found what, was, what for me is important, I think for my husband and myself, it's important is, is to make sure that we rear sons that are not insecure about and, and not fixated necessarily on the role of women. Yeah. And that they are comfortable to embrace whoever they choose 
to be even a, lo a lifelong partner, you know, a lifelong partner, if that's the route that they should go, because you never know, some, you know, some boys might decide, I don't want to get married. I, we don't even know that answer. But whatever choice they make is, is that if they are a partner to a woman, is understanding that you embrace all of who she is, and that, you know, you are not insecure about her, I want to use the word, her, her power, her mm. strength, yeah. and that you are comfortable to embrace it, and that together you will complement each other to, yeah. to, you know, to, to move to, to, higher, to higher levels, if, if I could sort of, um, you know, and to aspire to, to greater things, and not just material things. Um, for me, it's important that it's a combination of, you know, you live, comf there's no shame in living comfortably, but do not lose your faith in the process. For me, it's that spiritual bedding that is for me, you know, I, I would not be happy if my children, have, you know, were successful, materially supported their partner, but there was no spiritual grounding, you know, yeah. that faith wasn't important I my children know I'm a bit opinionated in that area. That would be that would sit that would be a, an area that would be a little bit uncomfortable um, with me. But I'm very open to different cultures. I'm open to the fact that I can't dictate who my children will, you know, potentially settle with in the future. But yeah. that they are embedded in some sort of, you know, spiritually embedded. And that they also, I think the one thing that we always try and consistently um, deliver as a message to our children is we embrace people for who they are, not what they are. Mm. It's important that it's the being within and not the, the external being. Um, mm. that's, that, that's quite key um, to us yeah. and to me, if, uh, and, you know, as a mother. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, you know, so we as a startup organization, Big Succeed, what would be your advice to us, you know, having been sort of so many years in, in business and we are really at the start of this, what would be your advice to succeed? I think, I think with any startups, and I can think because I've done a couple of them, even within McDonald's, we have little startup businesses. The one yeah. thing that I think you've sort of done remarkably well, Nishani, and I'm not sure that you even recognize it. And this is that first milestone. The first milestone from any with any startup is driving awareness. People need to be aware of who you are, what you stand from. Yeah. Your second strategy would always be about acquisition. How do you recruit people that would support your agenda yeah. you know whether it's sponsorship whether it is donations and I think the one thing that landed very well with me is the fact that you're not just going in to deliver sanitary towels you your the ex sanitary towels might be the the the, the first yeah. step in yeah. the yeah. exactly but you're using that to be able to sure that you can create an environment that's uh, for those women that's beyond a basic right. Yeah. And, and you're using it as a way to show women that you know they can aspire to more. Mm -hmm. They can dare to dream. Yeah. Um, so for me, I think you're on the right track. You've moved from awareness. From awareness, I would move to acquisition. And I think you will do success. You'll succeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Great. Is there anything else you would like to add, Joanne? You know, one thing that I find always very interesting is two things. Be careful. I always, I think I said at the beginning of the program, be conscious of your word. I think yeah. we underestimate that we can create with it and we've mm. got to choose what we create. Um, I think one of my, if I, if I don't want to use the word regret, one of my things that I think of now, which I probably didn't think of years ago, is just naming your children is important. Mm -hmm. Because that's, you've created them, and then you've created them through a word, and that word is their name. Brent, yeah. meaning of his name is uphill battle, steep hill. And if I look <laughs> at the, the challenge that he's gone through in 2015, I'm thinking, steep hill, why did we, why did we mention, why did we call you Brent? <laughs> Even though we love him dearly. Yeah. Daniel, I dreamt of his name. I dreamt of Daniel in the lion's den. So yeah. when, I, when, I, when I woke up and I was conscious, I said, his name will be Daniel John. Yeah. 
because I didn't give his name. That name came through in a dream, in, in a spirit. Uh, Matthew means gift of God. Antonio is the youngest child. That means baby, bambino. And so I find that I think being conscious about your word and always reflecting on what words you're using to describe a situation or to request or to honor. Yeah. Be very conscious. Um, for me, that that is is um, uh, quite uh, important and quite key. Excellent, excellent. So you're talking about using your the, the sort of the your words as creative instruments. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you. We've come to the end of our time together. Um, and I really just want to thank you. It would be wonderful for Succeed to partner with McDonald's. It would be wonderful. Thank you for, for making this time and for going through the whole process of being, um, you know, I, I know we had to go through a process of McDonald's approving our time together even. So uh, <laughs> Sorry thank for you. That. No, 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 not at all. But thank you. Thank you for coming on board. Thank you for giving up an hour of your time with us. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. And for sharing your life so openly. Um, it, it really was an encouragement and almost oh, whenever I chat to people, it's almost as if I'm getting these messages and these seeds of hope for myself. You know, so I'm oh. sure this, yeah, I, I'm sure there's many people who needed to hear what you what you shared today and um, just want to honor you for that and thank you for that, Joanne. Thank you very much, Nashani, and best wishes to succeed as well. Yeah, thank you. And on behalf of Succeed and on behalf of Richard and, and Patrick, uh, we just want to say thank you once again for uh, joining us for this hour. Thank you for sharing with us and for being with us. And may God bless you. May God make his face to shine upon you. And may we continue to have hope alight our way in this, in this time. Thank you, everybody, and God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.